Every time you throw away a piece of plastic, it can be felt here in paradise. This is Midway Island in the Pacific Ocean, one of the most remote places on the planet, but one of the hardest hit by pollution. Tomorrow I'm going to go to Midway to visit the vast marine area that we just created. President Barack Obama has recently declared the National Wildlife Area, including Midway, the largest protected area in the US, the second largest on the planet. But it's too late for parts of it. Your coffee cup, water bottle, toothbrush, they may all float miles to end up on these shores. Inside these birds, the blubber of these seals, in the sand, and invisibly in the waves these dolphins call home. And eventually, these plastics may well end up inside you. CNN gained rare access to the island to see the toll of plastic you throw away every day and what that might mean for your body. Halfway between North America and Asia, Midway Atoll is one of the most remote places on the planet. It's five miles across, but has over half a million acres of submerged reef, every inch of which is controlled by strict federal law. We could only fly on a charter jet from Honolulu. Well, it looks extremely beautiful and tranquil from up here, the Pacific at sundown, but across the world's oceans, there are thought to be some five trillion pieces of plastic just floating as garbage. And it's taken us months to make this journey out to Midway, slap in the middle of North Pacific Gyre, what's thought to be the biggest garbage patch in the world's oceans at the moment. The jet can only land at night to avoid hitting the birds who swarm the skies in daylight. The Laysan albatross, its main resident, their growing chicks starting to fly. Yet something very unnatural is happening here. Well, dawn lets you see just how unbelievably beautiful this place is. So pristine here, you almost don't want to touch it or disturb it. This is a rock that came out of the ocean 25 million years ago. But the tide has left a line of trash all along the beach here pretty much as far as your eye can see. And it's amazing in the kind of detail too, of the things you find, like a plastic mannequin's head. If it rained in a city far away from here for a few minutes, maybe somebody bought themselves a plastic umbrella for a quarter of an hour. Just remember, none of this was used or brought here. It floated here for thousands of miles over months. We're 1,300 miles from the nearest city, Everything that you see on top of the sand is a real recent introduction. Matt Brown, with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, lived here for years and is our guide. What is that? Uh, who knows? Tea, something's warmed yeah. up in the sun. I wouldn't open it. No, I'm not gonna open it, don't worry, it's fine. <laughs> it's all right. I'm definitely not gonna drink it. And it is astonishing how they never stop cleaning up here. This just the last few years' worth, stacked on the runway, waiting for a ship to take it away. That umbrella, bottle or shoe, all start off here in a city, let's say in Asia, where most of the plastic in the ocean originates from. You use it for a minute or two, but it joins the waterways, takes decades to break down, maybe longer. Much of it joins the Great Pacific garbage patch and spins endlessly, caught in the ocean currents of the North Pacific gyre. The patch isn't easy to see, offered an almost invisible soup of tiny particles made when larger bits of plastic break down. Pound for pound, by 2050, there'll be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Midway is right on its edge, a rare place from which you can peer into it. This is the largest Laysan albatross colony on the planet. Half a million nests and 1.5 million birds. Fragile albatross chicks struggle to survive at the best of times, and this is the time of year where they first learn to spread their huge wings, custom built to let them swoop into the sea and catch their sea life prey. But more and more, what they catch is just as likely to have a brand name on it as fins. They mistake the billions of plastic bits floating in it to be fish. They feed that to their young, 
the chick's stomachs fill up with it. In fact, some die here as we film. Their bodies join a mulch of plastic debris that's just washed ashore. At this time of year, the smell on the island is gruesome. Death and decay hanging in the air. Some of this is natural selection that's always happened, the weak dying off. Plastic bottles, bottle tops, looks like a bit of a mop there. But the amount of plastic here, researchers worry, must be taking its toll too on the threatened birds. To fully see the impact, we head to Midway's second island, Eastern Island. It's still home to the old US airstrips used to attack the Japanese in World War II. But it's also now a new front line in the struggle to learn what plastic is doing to the food we eat. Here we see how plastic has gotten into a species. How long ago did that die? Not very long ago. You can see Matt cuts open a bird, dead for only a matter of days. So as you open it up, you can see that's incredible. All that plastic that's inside this bird. The same colors that distinguish this brand make it appeal to birds as food too. It's the color of squid. Nobody lives on this island anymore. Nobody's lived on this island for, for decades. This is all that has come in in the stomach of birds. Adult birds bring it back. They feed it to their chicks. And as the chicks pass away, the carcass lays here, the bones disappear, the feathers disappear, but what will stay are all these pieces of plastic that just so litter the just ground here. Pull up a handful here. It is amazing, actually, because I mean, it's just endless. I mean, everywhere. Every year, albatross adults bring five tons of plastic back to Midway, along with the food they're trying to feed their chicks. They're eating many of the same things that we eat. They're, they're feasting on fish. When we see an animal that relies on a wide swath of the ocean for survival, struggling to deal with plastic ingestion, that should be a warning sign to us. These are, you know, the canary in the coal mine, as it were, for the Pacific Ocean. Well, take your first glance at this beach, and obviously you can't see any problem at all. It's just paradise. But that isn't really the issue with plastics in the ocean. It's not about the biggest pieces that people get most concerned about. It's down on this level here on the beach, this myriad of tiny, brightly colored different specks. They're not coral. These are what scientists call microplastics, and they're all over this beach. People are, in fact, calling this sort of thing the new sand. What is a microplastic? It's the tiny particle created when larger plastic items, toothbrushes, bottles, bags, break down over decades. They float in the water and get eaten by sea life. They cause two problems. First, the fragments act like a sponge to other toxins in the water, pesticides and flame retardants, for example, suctioning them up and concentrating them. Secondly, they are themselves complex polymers, molecules the body can't fully break down. When they get really tiny, into a billionth of a meter as a nanoplastic, scientists have shown they can cross tissue membranes into fish cells. They say that is harmful to fish, their reproduction, immunity, survival skills. What we don't know is what happens when humans eat the fish or sea life. Is it harmful to us? It's already an urgent question. A leading US government scientist told CNN plastic is definitely in our food chain and drinking water. This isn't something maybe happening to our children. It's already here. Three billion people rely on the ocean for their food. Do you still eat sushi yourself? Not as often as I used to. Back at our boat, we attract some unexpected attention. We're not supposed to be that close unless seals actually come to us, but it's just amazing to be so close to a completely endangered species like that. These are the mammals people are looking at most closely to see what plastic ingestion could be doing to them, because we know they eat fish and that the fish eat plankton and the plankton can absorb lots of plastic. But in their blubber, researchers have found traces, <laughs> that's amazing, have found traces of plastic at relatively high levels. Hawaiian monk seals can be seen as a sentinel for exposure to plastics and other persistent organic pollutants for, for humans. In a few individual animals, we've seen very high levels, particularly in adult males, a couple measured at midway, and so they might be more susceptible to problems from disease exposure 
they might have lower reproductive rates from exposure to these chemicals. It is very troubling with every step of the food chain, the concentration that can be measured in the tissues of animals becomes not just cumulative, but magnified. Basically, feel their uh, hot breath coming out of their nose into your face, and just a, a little bit of the seal snot went into. Midway has always been vital to somebody, a home for birds to breed, a source of life to Hawaiians, and for the US and Japan, a place so strategic they fought a decisive battle for it in World War II. Wherever you step, you're still reminded here of sacrifices made that turned the war in America's favor of a naval battle where luck and courage combined to defeat Japan so unexpectedly, historians still marvel at it today, even now. It houses these sensors meant to detect radiation from a North Korean nuclear test. To get more of a sense of scale, we head out from the atoll towards the reef that encircles it, closer to the endless plastic of the Great Pacific garbage patch. It's often hidden under the surface, an almost invisible underwater soup of tiny fragments, and not easy to spot, like this, a sunken barge used to ship fresh water here when this was a Cold War early warning station. Man comes and leaves, but this isn't his home. It's theirs. Listen. That's the sound of dolphins talking. Well, far more intelligent animal in the sea than us now, and they just seem to be following us wherever we go, staggering completely unafraid, possibly not used to seeing boats that often, but in an ocean which, as we've been seeing, is being changed really permanently by man's behavior. Something just so staggeringly beautiful. The contrast could not be more stark. The message in these bottles that have floated thousands of miles to get here is clear. The trash from your quick, convenient gulp can end up anywhere on Earth and last forever. Yeah, smells of very, very weak, sugary something. We swim out towards the reef where garbage can be trapped. Sometimes debris reminds you of sacrifice, like this, probably an unexploded World War II bomb. And sometimes of carelessness, snagged on the coral. We drag this fishing net, which will slowly break down into fibers that fish eat, out of the water. Two, three. But further out, we spot a major problem. A white speck we have to swim to reach. Caught in a small inlet of the reef, a huge piece of styrofoam packing, slowly turning to soup. San Francisco has just banned styrofoam, maybe more cities would, if they saw and knew this. It's a magnet for toxins and chemicals in the water. The more it degrades, the more poisonous it becomes a floating island of chemicals, bottle tops, a scar on the surface. So much of the damage in these waters is hidden, but what is not is terrifying. To native Hawaiians, this is the crucible of life. They call it Papahanao Makuakea, where Father Sky meets Mother Earth. The spot just past the horizon we come from when we're born and back to which we go to die. Yet, despite being as far from civilization as you can get, civilization has imposed itself here, everywhere. This is the cost of our convenience world, of the tiny, disposable choices we make to throw something away, often several times an hour. And this is just the beginning of what those choices are doing to our planet and future.